Welcome to My Savior Lives Northland. This program offers you the opportunity to participate in a service of worship led by local pastors and members of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. MSL Northland is locally produced with a message for the world. Welcome to My Savior Lives Northland. My name is Pastor Marty Mabley. I'm pastor at St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Esco, Minnesota. Today we are recording here at Christ Lutheran Church in Superior, Wisconsin. As we will see in our readings today and in the sermon, we'll remember again the importance of questions and answers, not just in life, but in our relationship with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You can also watch this service on Vimeo at MSL Northland or on our website, mslnorthland.com. We'll be right back after this hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we live in the midst of so many dangers, that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for this, the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany, comes from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. 
The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among your brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there are many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge. But some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak. You sin against Christ." Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for today is according to St. Mark, the first chapter, verses 21 to 28. Glory to you, O Lord. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our Christian faith 
in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the most important things I learned while studying to be a pastor at the seminary really, in a sense, had nothing to do with Scripture at all. And it was a very common, very simple question that actually transcends beyond Scripture, beyond our life in the church, but into life in general. The question is this, why do you ask? You see, not all questions are created equal. Not all questions come with the same intent or same motivation. Every question we know has a motivation behind it. Some of them are readily known to us, some not so much. We know this as parents. Imagine a young teenager just having gotten their license comes to you and asks a very simple question. Do you know where the car is? Why do you ask? 
Well, maybe this teenager has, has received a sense of, of, of goodwill and wants to wash your car for you. Possibly, the teenager recently moved the car and parked it on a steep hill and now sees that it's no longer there. And then, of course, there's the most common question, do you know where the car is because they want to take the car out tonight? Different questions have different motivations, and for Paul, the question regarding meat offered to idols revealed a division in the church in Corinth. It revealed a rivalry. It showed that there was little love amongst the members in Corinth. In the season of Epiphany, the church asked another question, one that we know well from a very popular Christmas hymn. What child is this? Similar to Luther's famous question, what does this mean? The question of what child is this, the question seeking to be answered during the season of Epiphany, is meant to teach. It's meant to instill in us and remind us of the wonderful gift of this child born in Bethlehem, this child who is both true God and true man. Rightfully so, Christians celebrate at Christmas the fact that God takes on human form, becomes one of us. Epiphany reveals that this child born in Bethlehem, this Christ of Bethlehem, is also God. At Christmas, God appears as a man. At Epiphany, this child, this man, now appears to the world as God. The big question for Epiphany seeks to answer the question, who is Jesus? Asked in faith and anticipation, we receive answers throughout the readings, the gospel readings, during the season. So far, we have heard and been reminded and taught that Jesus is the light of the world, gathering nations together, as seen in the Magi. The Son taking his stand among sinners as Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River. The Lamb of God, as John the Baptist declares, that takes away the sin of the world. The master angler calling others, apprentices you could say, to become fishers of men. As you and I, in faith, receive these answers, knowing who Jesus is, is not just one more piece of information, a, another notch in our knowledge belt, but it is the knowledge that transforms us. It allows us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to answer the most important question as Jesus would ask his disciples late in his ministry, who do you say that I am? As the light of the world, Jesus is the light by which we see everything else. Especially, as Paul says in our reading today, that brother for whom Christ has died. In Corinth, the question is really about love for others. It's not about rights. It's not about status or knowledge or appearance. It's about love for our brother and our sister in Christ. In our Old Testament lesson, we are reminded that out of love, God sends to us and to the world one from among you, from your brothers. In our gospel lesson today, Jesus shows to be one who came not to wow people with his powers and abilities, not just to prove himself as true God, but truly to show the love of God for those that are broken and hurting and suffering, to bring healing and freedom to all. 
And in our epistle lesson today, Paul brings to our lives today this knowledge of comparing knowledge to love amidst the relationship we have one another as fellow believers. Have you noticed a trend in the culture wars today? It almost seems as these debates and these arguments have progressed, they've become almost sport. We want to watch and see that the other team gets trounced and humiliated. It started with satire, with some mocking. Then it became about winning the argument. And sometimes people are going for to see the enemy reduced to tears. Paul reminds us that it's about love about loving our neighbor as Christ has loved us. Jesus shows us this love in becoming man, so that as true God and true man, he might save us. And when the ultimate battle, defeating sin, death, and Satan on our behalf, as Jesus himself says, we learn love from another by him laying down his life for us. And we rejoice that in his love for us, we are loved, we are forgiven, we are renewed, and we are enabled to love our brother and our sister. We're all very familiar with the 1 Corinthians chapter 13 passage that we often hear read at weddings. It's a beautiful passage, words of encouragement and direction for the couple getting married. But it's really about the love of God in Jesus Christ. A former pastor of mine once shared with me and encouraged me that every time I read this passage, to insert, rather than the word love, the word Jesus. Hear these words from Paul today from 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. And I have prophet, if, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be turned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest is love. My brother or sister in Christ, who do you say Jesus is? By faith, we proclaim him to be God and man, our Savior Jesus Christ, who loves us and now enables us and calls us to love one another. In his most precious name, amen. And may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds to life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, 
We thank you for the love shown to us in revealing to us Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now work in us to love one another as we have been loved. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. for joining us in worship today. If you would like more information about a church in your area, or if this program has been a blessing to you, please send comments and contributions to MSL Northland, CO Mount Olive Lutheran Church, 2012 East Superior Street, Duluth, Minnesota, 55812. We appreciate your support and prayers for this ministry. My Savior Lives Northland is a production of Stokes Media House in conjunction with the Wisconsin and Minnesota North Districts of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and supported by viewers like you.